really want to make sure that all of you get the correct information here tonight from this panel here. Um, we had handed out a sheet with my le on my letterhead here with some of the facts and basics about the program. We ran out of copies, I'm sorry, so we're actually um, have asking the library to make a few more copies. So if you didn't get one, uh, please do ask for it once the copies are made. Uh, first, just right off the bat, this is the first out of many, many meetings and the first out of all entire 11 districts in San Francisco that we're holding a meeting about this. You are the first, actually, because I am a co-sponsor of legislation. We really want to hear from you what your concerns are and how we can shape this legislation in a way that really addresses some of the concerns that you have out here on the west side of the city. So just to uh, dispel a few of the rumors we heard out there really quick off the bat, we are in no rush to pass this legislation. In fact, we are looking at 2016 before the Board of Supervisors even takes a peep at this. I haven't even finished talking to all of it. 10 other of my colleagues on the Board of Supervisors. So please do not think that we are trying to jam anything through the board. This is the beginning of the conversation and you are actually the beginning of this. So we really hope that you'll take the time to learn from the planning department what exactly this proposal does, why San Francisco is out of compliance with state law. So with or without my co-sponsorship on this legislation, why we actually have to pass a local ordinance regarding the density bonus, okay? So again, um, again, with or without my co-sponsorship, this has to happen. So let's all be part of the conversation. Let's not be shunned out from the decision-making table. Amendments are still possible. In fact, we I've heard already some really great suggestions, and I want to hear more from you tonight, because there are still ways that we can make changes to this so that it really accommodates what our West Side residents care a lot about. So with that said, I know more people are coming in, but I'm going to turn it over to our planning department staff, Kirsten. Uh, who will explain the program. Uh, really appreciate if you can listen through uh, the rest of her uh, presentation and hold the questions until she's... Until she's... Sorry, I don't know. New battery. Oh. Okay, so we really appreciate if you could just listen all the way through her presentation and then there will be opportunities for questions. If we don't get to all of your questions, I am willing to stay behind and answer them for you. Okay, thank you very much. Hi folks, uh, real quick, my name is Jeff Buckley. I'm the Mayor's Housing Policy Advisor. Um, the reason that we're here to talk with you is about this affordable housing bonus program. And I'll keep my remarks very, very short. Um, within the city, as you know, we have an affordability crisis that many of our residents you have a hard time hearing it? Talk right into it. Okay, I'll try. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> that might not be better. Um, so we, we have an affordability crisis in the city. And we have an affordability crisis. Plugged in So we have an affordability crisis within the city. It's affecting not just very low income folks, it's also affecting people up middle income and beyond. And this program this program is intended uh, to help serve our middle income population, many of which are not being served by affordable housing programs, not being served by the market as it currently is. And so what we have found ourselves in is a situation where the, the there was a Napa County court decision that required us to be able to enable a legislation that would allow for a state density bonus law to be put into effect here in San Francisco. And so we, we saw that decision and we asked a number of people, housing experts and others, to help us think through technically, how could we adopt this ordinance in San Francisco now that we are required to be able to do it? And how can we do it in a way that helps serve populations in the city that are not being served. And that in particular, with the mayor charged, many of those technical uh, folks to come up with, is a way of serving the middle income. And so what we, so we had a, a very short period of time where we asked a bunch of housing experts to give us some ideas how to do that. And then what happened was we had to kind of go workshop it, figure out how to make it work, and how to bend that program in such a way that can help serve a middle income program locally that isn't served at the state level through the state program. 
And so what you'll see before you is, is our attempt at being able to, to do that and provide uh, the highest level of affordability possible um, for both uh, moderate income residents but also middle income residents and achieve a 30% affordable for those populations within the development. And so we're happy, as, as Supervisor Tang talked about, uh, me personally, I'm happy to stay as long as possible and answer any questions people have about this program, about the mayor's housing policies in any way. But we, we wanted to, for you to understand the intent behind it when it came forward and what we're hoping to achieve. Uh, and with that, um, Kirsten Dishinger from the planning department is going to walk you through some of the kind of nuts and bolts of the program. Um, we're happy to answer any questions um, and can be a resource for you. Okay. Oh, there you go. So thanks, everyone. Good, uh, good evening. Thanks for coming out tonight. It's nice to see so many people interested in uh, affordable oh, housing. Oh, there you go. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I only have what I was born with. Um, so I will try my best to project as loud as I can into this microphone. Can people hear me now? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how's that? Yes. Okay. So as Jeff said, we do have a lot of reasons to be looking at this program and a lot of sort of inputs. And that's the first thing we really want to talk about is why did we get started with thinking about affordable housing bonus program? The first thing is since 1979, there's been a law in the, on the state books that says if you build affordable housing, you get a density bonus. So if you build some affordable units, you get some density. If you build more, you get more. It's been around since 1979. San Francisco had always taken the position that this only really applies if people elect to provide affordable housing, like our 100% affordable housing projects. We've entitled maybe 10 or 15 projects under this program, and they've gotten their density bonuses through an SUD process, or a special use district. But in 2013, the Supreme Court of California published opinion that said, all of California, there's some clarity around this. If people provide affordable units, even if they're required by a local inclusionary program, even if they're required by a local inclusionary program, then you must offer them a density benefit. You must allow them to build more market rate units depending on how many affordable units they provide and depending on what level of affordability. So there's this state density bonus law that now San Francisco needs to become in compliance with. In, I don't know how many people are familiar with our inclusionary housing program, but it currently requires that any project that has 10 units or more, any residential building that is proposing to build 10 units would also be required to make 12% of those units affordable. So just to do a simple math project for a 100 unit building, 12 of them would need to be permanently affordable. We've been working on this from a policy to a program since 1993. It's now a requirement. It's changed over the years. That's where it is today. When we heard about this court ruling, we were imagining that means every project in the city of San Francisco, of which most are larger than 10 units, would be asking... Can you speak up, please? Is it possible to turn the speaker more loud? I'm going to keep rolling while they work on the AV because we only have 30 minutes. Somehow that's that's much better somehow. Okay, great. So, uh, ooh. wow. Um, so, so where I forget where I was. Okay, so uh, that means every project in San Francisco with 10 units or more might be coming to the planning department and requesting this increased density, and we had no program to help understand what that would mean, what that would look like. I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. But also, as Jeff kind of outlined, and as I'm sure all of you who read the media or are involved in your neighborhood or care about San Francisco, we have these neat affordable housing needs. And so this need to develop a local program and the need to come up with many different tools to address the many different affordable housing needs kind of came together in 2014. 
this slide, I think, kind of explains the design of the program, what we were thinking. Off to the right, you can kind of see what the state law reads like. If any of you, I know a lot of you are very um, engaged, so if any of you have read the state law, you know it's incredibly prescriptive, it's incredibly permissive, and it is incredibly developer friendly. It tells them, you, for every affordable unit you provide, you get a certain amount of density. In addition to that, you get from one to three incentives. They're not defined, or waivers from the planning code. They're not defined. There's not a clear, you know, up to this amount, or but you have to make sure you meet this or that. It just says whatever you need to offset the costs. And then you could also get whatever heights you need to accommodate the additional density. How some municipalities, um, uh, administer this is they have a program where they kind of study every single site and kind of negotiate back and forth with the developer developer about what that might look like in San Francisco we entitle way too many projects to be imagining doing that with any project that's 10 units or more we also don't want to be in a position where the planning department and developers are negotiating with this sort of very favorable state legislation as the only arbitrator of that nego negotiation. So we designed a program that kind of said, you get density as defined by the law, you get in waivers, but only as our study showed you actually need in the San Francisco development context. We looked at 11 or 12 different sites with an architect. We asked them to model. We asked them to say, what would a good building look like if it had more density? Let's, let's allow that under our program, but nothing more. So not covering the full rear yard, but maybe some waiver in your rear yard to fit those extra units. And in some cases, you might need heights under the state program, but only when our formula in our planning code says so. Not a negotiation between me and my colleagues in the development community, but a formula that's very clear and non-negotiable. So that's sort of the design of our state analyzed program. And then our third program is the local program, or sorry, our second program is the local program. We developed this because the state program, when we looked at it, really only encourages people to develop 13 to 20% affordable housing on site. That's one or a little bit more than our existing inclusionary. But we just passed Prop K that asked the city to consider 33% as the target for affordable housing production. So our team worked on it and said, how could we encourage 30% affordability in market rate projects? And that's where we said, if we take what we know the state program offers and add just a little bit more, that's where we get the local program. We don't think the local program works on every site, but on some sites we think it will um, facilitate 30% affordability. These are our program goals. I think the most important and the central one and the one that drove us is incentivizing higher levels of affordable housing and also adding a middle income layer to that. I'm gonna go a little fast because I know I'm already behind time. Um, so this is a map of our program area. I know Supervisor Tang handed out a number of these. It includes districts that allow that regulate density by a ratio of units to lot area so these are places that have older zoning maybe you live in one of them or are familiar so you might have a density limit of one to 600 one to 800 that's these districts um, rc districts residential commercial residential mixed use and neighborhood commercial districts and rh3 Notably, it does not include RH1 and RH2, which is a, over 72% of our city. Um, mostly that's because those districts allow one or two units. So the idea of incentivizing a certain percentage of affordability doesn't make sense. And the state law only is required for projects that are of a certain size that are greater than two units. So generally, these are our areas on major corridors that have residential or have commercial uses either encouraged or required on the ground floor and they're generally near transit um, again the key point um, for this program is all about providing affordable housing for people in the city of San Francisco we were truly really trying to incentivize higher levels of affordability our current inclusionary housing program provides affordable units for two different income levels um, this is a good snapshot. 50% um, AMI is close, it's actually 55. 
These households earn $36,000 for one person, up to $51,000 for a four-person household. Oops, wrong way. And they also target close to the 80% AMI, which is 57,000 for one person and 82,000 for four people. And as all of you can see, the prices on the bottom for rental and owner, those are much lower than what our market is currently serving. This program produces units for these households, but also adds to the permanently affordable housing stock, housing for people who are at 120% of the area median income, so a single person earning 85000 who can afford only 2100 in rent, or a family of four earning 122000 who can afford $3,000 in rent. And we're also adding an ownership component, permanently affordable ownership housing for households at 140% of the area median income. These are single people earning 100000 or more likely a family earning 143000 uh, these people can order can afford five hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars at the top end for a new home, which is far below what our market is currently asking. Um, so the program area is very large. I think that's probably why there are so many of you out here. It feels like a really big program area, but it's actually mostly filled with really good, healthy buildings that we expect zero change on. We did what we call a soft site analysis, which is where we look at what's on the ground now and what development potential this program would encourage. And then we analyze whether we think there would be a market motivation for the project to move forward. It's, it's not super magic. It's basically how much building is there, what's it worth, and how much building could be there. There are about 240 sites that we think are soft meaning they could benefit from this program. Depends on who the owners are, whether they're interested in selling. There's all kinds of issues, but this is a 20-year program, so we're looking out over that period. If those sites all developed under today's rules, we'd see about 7,400 units. If all of them chose to provide their inclusionary units on site, we'd see about 900 affordable units. This is just those 240 program uh, soft sites in the program area. Correct. Correct. Oh, thank you. So it's not not a in the for inclusionary. The inclusionary program. Thank you. The inclusionary program um, is you could provide the units on site or you can pay a fee. That's how it's currently drafted. <laughs> However. Under the state program and the local program, there is no fee option. If you pay the fee, you cannot um, participate in the program. So that means, number one, I see a lot of people don't want to see the fee paid. This is a reason, an incentive to get the developer to choose the on-site option over the fee. So for me, I think that's really interesting because, I hear you. Um, they're telling me to speed up. Um, so, uh, focus on the okay. It's an important thing. It's complicated. Let it let it evolve. Go ahead. Fast and slow. Okay. So, um, <laughs> no problem. And loud. Um, so, so th I think this is a program because they because there are incentives for providing the units on site rather than paying the fee that will encourage projects that have that option to choose to provide the units on site. We can talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, so the state program, if everyone chose the, those 240 sites citywide chose the state program, we'd see about 10,000 units. And you can see the affordability goes up a little bit too. But under the local program, we'd see about 16,000 new units, but the affordability really goes up. S serving that 50 and 80% AMI, that lower income levels, we're at about 2,000, so double, what, a little over double what we could produce under today's rules. And then for the middle income, we would see 3,000 additional afford permanently affordable units. Um, really quickly, uh, the nuts and bolts of the different program options. The state program is very prescriptive. All our program is doing is setting boundaries for what would be allowed in terms of the incentives and concessions if a project chose the state option. They would get, they would do their inclusionary on site, add a few more units of affordable housing, bringing them to 13 or 20 percent affordability. Our study, which was conducted by David Baker, architecture firm um, 
found that actually very few incentives are really required in terms of the kinds of variances we normally offer or modifications we normally offer. And in some cases, they need zero stories of height, in some cases one, and in some cases two. So we've limited it to two stories, but again, it's by a formula, and it's only to be able to accommodate the density that we know that they are granted by state rights. Under the local program, we've kind of built on that framework, but said, if you're willing to meet us with 30% affordable housing on site, so for example, if you're willing to make three of your nine unit building or six of your 20, 18 unit building uh, affordable, um, then you know you could benefit from this program. So what benefits does it offer? They say, we said, let's instead of regulating density by the size of your lot, let's regulate it by the, the size of the building that's allowed. So by your height and your bulk. This is something that most cities are moving their zoning co controls towards, and we've started to do in other parts of the city. We've also said, in order to help offset the additional, additional costs of the affordable housing, you could do, um, you would get an additional two stories. Um, so two stories and then height regulated by height, or density regulated by height and bulk. I think it's really important to note that one thing that we've done on the east, when we've looked at form-based code and that we've also included in this program is requiring that 40% of all the new units in the building are two bedrooms or larger. We know that family housing, housing for people with children is really important. So if, in the interim, I'll, I'll just shout a little louder. Um, so the state density bonus does not allow us to set a standard of the number of bedrooms. So one of the things that we asked was we wanted to see family units that would come from this. And we're defining family units as two bedrooms or more. And so that is a local requirement that we're putting onto the program in order to have more family-sized moderate income units and middle income units. So a key theme for the local program is hitting local goals that we couldn't accomplish under the state program. So that's 30% affordability, middle income housing, and family housing. Um, I saw a lot of information get shared on Nextdoor about 100% affordable housing and what's going to happen with this program. And I just want you to know that historically we've only used the state density bonus program for 100% affordable housing. What we've done with this program is just basically reduce the amount of friction between the planning department and those projects as they move through and request these state density bonuses. We did a study, we worked with Peter Cohen and his whole group, a lot of the developers in that area to say, if we could do everything to make an 100% affordable housing project work, what would we do? He didn't say, oh, we want 10 stories or five stories because these projects are really complicated and they require deep public subsidy. So they really only can, can build up to 80 feet after that, they're too expensive to get built. So we aren't talking about you know very tall buildings for this construction type. Seventeen. Yeah. So we're, and, <laughs> we, I gotta keep talking, or they will. We only produce, and we only produce about two or three of these a year. They're very limited by our public resources and our ability to fund them. I'll let Jeff and Peter kind of talk more about the pipeline projects and where they might be. But as far as I know, there aren't any proposed in the Sunset District. Um, the reason we offered three stories is there are some sites, especially in the Mission, that currently have 50-foot height limits. And in those areas, they, they're really working hard to provide more affordable housing. So they said, if these buildings this could... This is the beach. This is the ocean. This is our... Okay, this is, a, this is a citywide program. So um, in that case, those, those projects could really benefit from being able to go an additional three stories. Yep. And then the last thing I wanted to hit is the, the improvement and enti or the entitlement process. We are not changing the entitlement process. These projects would still have neighborhood notification. They would still go to the planning commission. They would be reviewed under CEQA and for design review as all new development projects are. 
and these are some of the new design guidelines. I'm not, I am behind time. So I'm going neighborhood specific. So um, we can go back to anything during the Q&A. So these are the zoning districts in your neighborhood. You can see that of your neighbor, of the supervisor's district, most of the parcels are excluded from the program. There are some neighborhood commercial districts and a few RM and RH3 parcels. Um, and so those are what were included in the program area because they currently allow more than a certain number of units <clears throat> and they allow residential and generally commercial on the ground floor. What are those highlighted areas specifically? Uh, oh, color coded. The yellow. What is that? I'm not supposed to answer questions. Yeah. But for us to understand. Okay, so I'm going to keep shouting. And maybe this will start working. Okay, so the, the colors are the zoning districts. The purples are neighborhood commercial districts. So those are generally where uh, commercial is required or encouraged on the ground floor and residential is above. And the yellow areas are um, RH3 is the orangish one, and RM districts, residential mixed use, are the yellow areas. The things that are grayed out are the RH1 and RH2, where only one or two units are permitted. So only the yellow goes higher. All of the colors on that map, all of the things that are not gray, are part of the program area. The only sites where additional height is permitted is a site that is soft and is in you know un goes under development what, what color what color they're not colored so this is i'm going to keep going no questions no questions um i'm going to keep going what do i have seven more six more minutes so this is the density limits for those areas. You can see that in your district, the program area generally has a pretty low density limit, meaning it doesn't allow a large number of units per lot area. So one to 800 is generally what's um, within the districts in your area. What means soft? I at least want to understand what you are saying, if I may. I'm gonna keep talking and that to the Q&A. So this is the height limits for your district. So the yellow areas are uh, generally 40 foot height limits currently and the orange areas are 50 to 80 foot height limits. I don't see any orange areas. I just see a boundary. I just see an orange boundary. I don't see any orange at all. Okay, I'm, I'm going to keep rolling. I'm sorry if everyone can't see the images. We will put these all up online, um, as are many of the materials right now. <clears throat> this map is really just to illustrate a key point, which is most of the pro most of the program area throughout the entire city, not just in your neighborhood, is within a quarter mile or walking distance of important transit corridors, what's called the Muni Rapid Network, which are the key corridors that MTA and the city are investing in. So we're building housing where we're investing in transit. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about next steps, so I just want to provide um, a little bit about that before Jeff jumps in with some closing remarks. Essentially, we are having an informational hearing at the Planning Commission on November 5th. This will be the third informational hearing on this item at the Planning Commission. Um, we will then, um, recommendations from the Planning Commission will be developed. We're hoping to have a hearing with them on December 3rd to gather those recommendations. They would be sent to the Board of Supervisors. As Supervisor Tang pointed out, in early the next year, we would start our process with the Board of Supervisors at the Land Use Committee. Um, there'd be hearings there, recommendations and amendments, and then finally the Board of Supervisors. So how are you gonna go around the city? If you're gonna do all this by December and Please early let January. Her and, the and I'm happy to answer questions. any questions okay. in the question and answer session. This is a very important motion. We are gonna this is our community. I will just say that. Yes, we are going to meet, meet yeah. through all of the districts.
throughout the city before we go to the board of supervisors. Out of control, you will have to be asked to leave. I'm, there's a lot of people Nobody's in the room. You all have questions. Oh, no. We want to get you as much information as possible. Thank you. But people don't understand what's being said. So how can you how can you proceed? Yeah. So folks, just a few very key points I want people to understand. The program is not eligible. The program is not eligible in single family home areas and districts. It is on transit corridors. And it, this is a program that will happen over time. We expect there to be a gradual uh, interest in this program over time. And it's spread throughout the district, uh, throughout the city. Um, and we expect there to be over time, the number of units that you saw will come within about 20 years or so. So I, I think these points, we're, we're happy to answer any questions, both in this format as well as individually afterwards, so that you understand some of the facts about the program and you understand the impact that it's going to have within the city. We do not have this conversation lightly. We understand many of you have very busy lives. There's many things you can do. And the fact that you're here for us certainly shows that this is a very important issue and something we're going to take very seriously. We already have been taking it very seriously. Um, but we just want you to know some of those things before we kind of get into, I think, further discussions. One last point that I'm just going to repeat that I said earlier. With or without my co-sponsorship on this legislation, this legislation is moving forward. Okay, we are out of compliance with state law. If you would like to see developers negotiate unlimited waivers and concessions from our planning code, which includes increased height limits, that, that is what we're left with. That 2013, sorry, that 2013 court case that came out of the city of Napa that Kirsten alluded to earlier, that Jeff mentioned, that is very serious. And so I need you all to understand that point. We don't really have a choice to not pass a legislation. Well, so at this point, so at this point, it's up to all of us to figure out what are the sort of program elements that you would like to see that would make this something that our neighborhood would feel more comfortable with that after I talked to 10 of my other colleagues that their districts feel comfortable with as well, okay? So this is the beginning of the conversation. Okay. 300 organizations and individuals with the idea that San Francisco can become a pro-housing city we are very encouraged by what we see with this presentation tonight. I don't think enough emphasis has been placed on the housing affordability crisis uh, that is making San Francisco into a distinctly hostile city to our young, our new families, entry-level workers, seniors, our creative class, who are being forced out of the city. The city in, uh, uh, in California with the highest and I'm sorry, the fastest increasing housing prices is Oakland. And there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. The city, the numbers are pretty daunting, and that's sort of what is the basis of this conversation. It's not about values, it's about numbers. The city is growing by 10,000 people per year for the last several years and will continue to grow. It is, it is the result of having a red-hot economy that is the envy of any city in the United States. They can't hear you. The planners... Plan, let's try that. Time. Still there? No, not there. Thank you. I will keep trying. I'll do what I can. Planners are telling us that in 20 years, San Francisco must accommodate one million residents. But what about earthquake safety? Nobody's Planner, talking about that. Planners are telling us this. These people are coming because of our economy. But I'm the question, Why Miss, should I be you will have it. Please, if you keep yelling out, we're going to ask you to leave okay. because we got to keep the meeting I, I moving. But Your questions will get that, answered. Though. It's kind of hard. Planners, Thank you. This, these are the hard numbers. No one yeah. shows these numbers. These are the numbers. The we can respond to this or not. Please be now, respectful of others. I am. So, so this program that you're seeing tonight. We are encouraged because it appears to be the first serious attempt in recent memory to do something about middle-income housing, which is the, the sector of the housing population that is most poorly served in San Francisco. 
There's a map up on the wall there. When you get a minute, go look at it. Look at the sunset. When you see yellow, means it doesn't apply there. What is, what is under discussion for the sunset is a very, very small part of the entire sunset. It's the purple transit corridors. You can look for lavender colors and RM3. It's, it can't be more than 10% of the total sunset that is even eligible under this. There are more numbers here. So look at that when you get a chance and take a deep breath and say, is my neighborhood where I live really at risk of this or is it just the transit corridors? There's something else I'd like to emphasize here. Part of our neighborhood. I'm, it's not our neighborhood, it's our city. Dennis, as to the question of the city, I'm here in a, in a certain capacity as an emissary. I go to lots and lots of community hearings, community meetings about housing. And I regret to say that in a lot of them around San Francisco, there's a lot of anger at West Side neighborhoods because, because of a strongly held perception that some neighborhoods have to take all the housing because other neighborhoods don't take any. For instance, Whatever. for instance, in District 10, Whatever. in the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, District 4, in, in the, in, these are the numbers. The numbers are what they are. In the last 10 years, the District 4 has produced about 56 new homes. By comparison, District 10 in the southeast part of the city has produced 30 times that housing. So people are saying at meetings in other parts of the city, when we're trying to address a housing affordability crisis, would it kill them to take a little bit of housing? And that's... So, so the question is, is there's, there's a widely held perception that in many parts of San Francisco, the, the reaction is, go away, we're full, you, no new people can come here. That's a difficult... It's a difficult position to take at City Hall if you're trying to get your voice heard in legislation. I think that this is a great plan. It deserves your attention. It deserves your consideration. You should weigh in on it. On how, the Outer Sunset is not an island. It's part of San Francisco. One would hope that a group of intelligent people could get together and say, we've thought about it. Here are our, our ideas about how to improve housing and to provide solutions for the people that need it and to try and prevent this brutal displacement crisis. Thank you. I appreciate your patience. Peter Cohen may be speaking more to what you want to hear. He'll have five minutes and then we will take questions and we will be able to get more specific answers. Thank you. Can someone pay? Just don't touch it. Just don't touch the mic. Do I have to lean down? Okay, I'm, I'm not going to touch the mic. Thanks for having me. I'm Peter Cohen, and um, either Fernando Marti or I, we're both co-directors of the Council of Community Housing Organizations, were asked to be here tonight uh, for what Susan called balance. Uh, we're not opposed, we don't have a position, but as Susan said, we're here to ask questions, and we've asked a number of questions, so none of these will come as a surprise to the planners. Uh, don't beat them up too bad. Uh, they're here to hear what you have to say, and they know there's a lot of concerns, and they're very legitimate. So as Kirsten said as I got up here, uh, I'm not here to further divide the situation. I'm just here to ask the hard questions that need to be answered, frankly, before a program like this goes forward. I'm not going to go through the PowerPoint because I think it'll just it'll just um, get too much in the details, but we have uh, a number of questions that I want to just lay out for you. And these may relate to things that you all are, are wondering yourselves. The first is, um, is all this really necessary by state density bonus law? You heard the premise that this is required, uh, the supervisor said, because the city is out of compliance and therefore this must be done. Uh, we beg to differ about what exactly needs to be done. There is a compliance with state density bonus law, but it's important that we actually distinguish between what is coming into exact conformance and what the city is trying to do as a matter of policy to incentivize more housing and more affordable housing, which isn't a bad thing in and of itself. 
But I think that needs to be very carefully looked at so we don't just assume that everything that's on the table here is because the city has to. There is, a, there is a gray space between what's being required and what is actually a proposed policy. Right? I say that objectively. The second question is, it's a basic deal. Okay? The work we do, and we're in the affordable housing world, is about finding the best deal. So is the city getting as much in exchange for what it's giving in terms of development bonuses? It's a very fair question. You've seen the sort of high-level summary of a 30% of affordable housing in exchange for various things. But when you look at the details, it's quite a bit. Again, I'm not saying that it's not a fair deal, but a project sponsor can get up to two additional floors of development, no density controls whatsoever, an increase of five feet on the ground floor, as well as the choice of up to three additional what they call zoning modifications, reducing the rear yard, reducing the exposure to adjacent units, reducing the amount of parking required, etc. Again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but there's a lot that's being given, and the question we all should be asking is, do we think we're getting as much as we can out of that deal? Our position at this point in this economy is there's no reason to over-incentivize development. It's going to happen whether you incentivize it or not, so make sure you're getting a good deal out of it. That's question number two. Again, I say these objectively. The third question is, um, will this program result in family units? You heard that talked about. What's being required in the so-called local program is 40% of the units are two bedrooms. The rest can be small units. What we know is the market tends to build small units because it's the most profitable way to construct. You can get studios or even micro units or one bedroom units, which work fine for singles or perhaps couples or folks who are coming through fairly quickly. But if we're looking for family units and middle income family units, they gotta be at least two bedrooms or larger. So 40%, is that enough? Can we get more percentage of those units being family? Second and related to that is what is a family unit? A two-bedroom unit in and of itself doesn't have any size standards. We're getting very small two-bedroom units on the east side of the city building 750 square feet in my neighborhood. So part of the question is what are the standards that we all want for a family unit? Supervisor, I think that's a very important question. I know Supervisor Yee is talking about that. What does it take to have housing for families so they can go through a life cycle and not just squeeze themselves into something that's called a quote-unquote two-bedroom? So the size matters. That's the third question. The fourth question is, are the income targets right? You heard the proposal here of targeting all the bonus units for either 120% or 140% of what's called the median income. What the city has formally defined as middle income stretches all the way from 50% of the median income, so for a single person it's about 45,000 bucks or so a year, all the way up to 150. It's a big span. The middle class is a lot of different folks. The question is, where on that spectrum from 50 to 150 do you want to make sure this housing is affordable? And I think that's a legitimate question. 120, 140 may be the right spot. What about 80? What about 90? What about 100? So it's for you folks to think about who are we trying to serve because those are very specific affordability targets. Either you're overqualified or you're underqualified. Fifth question. Um, sure, that's fine. I've got two more questions. How does the program address the development review process? Just, you know, as a matter of course, is the development review process any different than you have now? Is that height automatic? Is there any kind of design review process that you feel is, is not sufficient? What's the planning commission adoption process? These are just basic questions. What you heard from planning is nothing's different. And if that's the case, the question you should have is, is the current process working for you? <laughs> The sixth question is, what will happen, and this is, this is big, I, I think this is, this is really important and, and we haven't had a chance to talk about this with planning. What happens when you have existing buildings on a site? Mm -hmm. Especially what if they're rent controlled buildings? And what if there are existing commercial retail tenants in those buildings? Are we inadvertently incentivizing demolition of housing and commercial space? Now, now hang on a second. I, I, again, I ask these as objective questions, but if that's the case, and you're going to say take a two-unit building and you're going to tear it down and build a nine-unit building, are those units going to be replaced one for one and the folks who are living there have a right to return? And on top of that, are you going to get 
the bonus or are those going to start being double counted? Mm -hmm. We have a policy issue in San Francisco and it's come up a number of times at the Planning Commission in the last two or three months of rent controlled housing being demolished and we have no formal requirement. In fact, state law restricts our ability to require rental housing to be, uh, rent controlled housing to be replaced. So we want to make sure we're resolving that question and not, in, and not displacing some folks to replace them with others. Same thing with commercial tenants, which is even more difficult because commercial rent control is illegal in California. So will, will retail tenants have a relocation right? Will they have a right to return? These are tough questions that may or may not be answered through the bonus program, but they're very serious policy questions. And the last question we have is, beyond the housing itself, all the questions that's raised, 6,000 units. This is a big program, folks. It might take 20 years. But this, I would argue, for a lot of the city, is a very significant change in zoning and development potential, right, yeah. that hasn't happened in a long time. What about the infrastructure that comes with it? Thank right? you. Yeah. So this is a question we always ask, right, in affordable housing or otherwise. What about the transit infrastructure? What about the community facilities? Is there sufficient child care in the neighborhood? How are those kinds of, of infrastructure improvements paid for? Is that come as part of the development? Again, very big thorny questions. Kirsten went through a 10-year planning process of Market Octavia. We've done a lot of area planning in the east side of the city. This isn't area planning, this is just a zoning program. But the same questions about sufficient infrastructure should be asked. How about climate change? So those are, my, those are our questions that was in the PowerPoint. And I, got, I wanna make clear, folks, we're not here to try to sabotage the planning department. Our role in this city in trying to influence public policy is to ask the hard questions and make sure that there's, there's no kind of quick shortcuts just because something sounds good. So we're generally supportive of the idea of coming up with creative ways to create more affordable housing, including affordability for a whole range of folks. But we do also believe you gotta get it right before you move forward because it's very difficult to clean things up if they don't work right. So we're here to help and also ask the hard questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are the questions we want to hear from all of you. Those were really great suggestions about how it is that we can improve this program even more. Yes, we do have to be in compliance with state law, but what are the elements that you would like to see? So thank you for those, those questions. Do you want to go ahead and get answers to those questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have to tilt this just, okay. <laughs>